Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome all of you to Coffee Break session uh, dedicated to new generation warfare. My name is Andras Ratz. I'm here from the Finnish Institute of International Affairs, and I have both the pleasure and the honor uh, to share the panel with a great colleague, Edina Lange Yonatamishvili from the NATO Center of Excellence of Strategic Communication. Uh, and here, hopefully, we will try to share our views with you all about new generation warfare and try to ask a few questions, both convenient and inconvenient ones, about this phenomenon. Whether it's new at all first, this would be my first question. Whether we really speak here about something that is brand new or as another option, isn't it possible that only just our memories are short? What do you think? Yeah, good evening, everyone. Um, I think that uh, it's a fair point uh, to say that there is not that much new uh, to what we call the new generation warfare, because if we look at the very ancient uh, philosophy of war or art of waging war, it's always been about uh, winning over people's hearts and minds, and this is what we see also today. If we look um, at, at the, how, for example, Russia frames its new generation war, uh, they also say that um, uh, they informational uh, domain will have four shares out of five and the military uh, will have just one share out of five. So this, it's, it's very disproportionate and uh, sometimes military play no role at all uh, in the new generation uh, war. So, but yeah, so this on one hand we say, yeah, this is nothing, nothing new, but at the same time, what is new is the technology uh, it is um, globalization, uh, internet, uh, and I would say that sometimes time and space is no more relevant and the speed is completely different and also we don't really have geographical borders anymore. I mean, of course, we can't talk about the whole world, unfortunately, yet, but uh, probably soon we will uh, come to that point. And there is also... Um, uh, another element, uh, ability of basically any person who has access to information environments, uh, normally that would be by means of this modern technology, like, uh, uh, for example, mobile phones are cheap these days, they're getting even cheaper. Uh, internet is spreading out, the access to internet is becoming even cheaper. So basically now, um, not just recruits uh, in the army can wage a war, but any citizen, any inhabitant of a country can just pick up a phone and become part of it. Uh, you know that uh, also uh, ISIS, for example, they've been even recruiting media soldiers. So you can be somebody sitting in Helsinki or in London or in Riga and be a media soldier for ISIS without even physically picking up a gun, but just doing it at your computer, spreading messages, writing blogs, etc., etc. So I would say this is the, this is the novelty. But uh, overall, uh, yes, this concept uh, has been known many centuries ago. So that's my, what's, what's your take on that? We're in the lucky situation that I agree, or almost agree, let's say. Being a military historian by education, uh, I would use to demonstrate the, the novelty or not that novelty of new generation warfare on the events in Ukraine. And each and every element that were used in Ukraine, uh, let it be the use of special operation forces, the use of diplomatic pressure, economic pressure, uh, diversion, uh, also information operations, each and everything, each and every element of these, including the setup of, of quasi-states, it's not new. Exactly. I mean, from many of the adversaries, we've seen these quasi-states, even in, uh, if one remembers just Finnish history, the beginning of Winter War, I mean, the, the, the pro-Moscow quasi-government set up in Eastern Finland, all these is not new at all. What is new, however, and you pointed out very rightly, I very much like that point, is technology that enables the coordination of all these old, mean, old, all these old means uh, in absolute real time. And Ukraine was a staggering demonstration of the real capabilities these new technological developments allow. Almost a real-time coordination of military and non-military measures, 
special operation forces supported by propaganda operations right there on the ground, I think this technology which allows the life coordination of the old tools, this is, this is one of the new elements. And yes, the information space and the widening possibilities, opening up in the information space, this is, this is another novelty. Yeah. And uh, if I may add, um, uh, one uh, Danish uh, researcher, uh, Thomas Nissen, uh, he recently released a book which is called uh, Weaponization of Social Media. And there he tries to look at how social networks can be used for actually military purposes, for command and control, exactly what you were referring to, uh, for intelligence gathering, um, for operational purposes, uh, for disinformation, which we saw hugely uh, during the Crimea and now East Ukraine uh, operations. Uh, Etc. So it's a, it's a very interesting read, and I advise you to look it up. It's, I believe, free copy also available on, on the internet. And another thing to add to support the argument that this new generation warfare is not that much new. I mean, ever since the end of the Cold War, both Western and Russian military literature is speaking about the modernization of warfare, newer and newer ways of fighting the wars. Uh, General Mahmoud Gareyev, uh, general, former general of the Russian army, in 1995 he wrote a book about what if war comes tomorrow. This was the title, uh, also worth, worth looking up. And even in 1995, General Mahmoudov argued the increased role of, uh, General Gareyev argued on the increased role of, uh, of information warfare in the future. So what I'd like to, to say here is that now when we discuss new generation warfare, we frequently mention Russia and the Daesh as, uh, mm -hmm. as actors. However, from their perspective, uh, in their literature, they write that it's actually the West which has developed these tools, the West which has employed uh, new generation warfare strategies and tactics and operations. Uh, and this is also an argument that the whole thing is not that new. Perhaps just we were not listening carefully enough. Yeah, I would agree to that. We were just perhaps not, not listening carefully enough, and we could be surprised. Mm -hmm. We could be surprised very well, uh, and not only by, by Russia, but also the, the capabilities of, uh, of Daesh and, uh, and other actors. Which leads me to the question I'm not an expert on, on at all. Uh, the possibilities of what you just briefly mentioned already. There is a lot of discussion right now in Europe about uh, how internet and internet commenting and social media networks, all these get penetrated and used for, uh, for strategic and military purposes. What's your opinion? Are there limits uh, to these kind of operations or what are the ways to, to, to manage them, to tackle them or to counter them? Yeah, I think uh, this is a, a phenomena, the, what, what is called the organized uh, trolling, which was very uh, prevalent uh, during um, let's say, Kremlin's information campaign against Ukraine and now also extending uh, against uh, the, the Western democracies. Um, so this is a phenomena that's been widely discussed. We've also had um, some exposures by investigative journalists, also by the trolls who've uh, quit um, uh, giving interviews uh, to the media, etc. But uh, actually the question is, what is the real life impact? What influence do they have? Because what we know from these interviews and exposures is that there are a lot of resources invested in it. So people are being hired, they're being paid money, etc., etc. They have a management, a very strict one. Uh, they obviously have, you know, uh, like computers, so equipment, so it all costs money. At the same time, what is the effect? We uh, at the center did uh, a little um, research uh, about um, uh, trolling on uh, news articles in the most popular uh, news portals in Latvia. And we looked at both languages, Latvian and Russian. And uh, first thing is that it's extremely difficult to identify what is an organized troll. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, of course, you can look at uh, the IP addresses that they use, but that's very easy to hide. So if you just use the IP identifier, uh, then you can see that about 3% of all commentaries uh, are, are like organized trolling. 
But then if you look at the content, uh, then potentially this number goes up uh, to about 10%, which is still not a lot, right? Uh, the difference is that uh, obviously they pick their targets, so either they look for articles which are extremely popular, and then they just uh, uh, put in their in piece of information, whether it's relevant to the topic or not, or they look for articles which are on the topic of their interest. For example, uh, you know, EU sanctions against Russia or NATO presence in the Baltic states and, 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 and uh, stuff like that. But then if you, if you ask the people who are reading the comments, like, uh, does that make any difference? Uh, then, uh, although it's just a small snapshot, but the conclusion was quite interesting. Normally, people are quite aware already of the troll activity, so they don't take it particularly seriously. Uh, they normally ignore that. Um, they, um, they don't feel that what the trolls are saying is actually having an effect on their opinion or their course of action. Uh, however, what the trolls do achieve, and my assumption is that potentially that is actually the aim, uh, is to create um, an emotional background, uh, a depression. Because uh, if you, like, I mean, what, what's uh, a better way to subdue a society but to depress it, right? That's, you know, basics of uh, psychological operations, uh, etc. So this is what they attempt to do. Therefore, you don't just get messages that Putin is great, Russia is right, or Russia is, is, is cool. You also get messages that Latvia is a failed state, um, we can't manage our own economy, etc., etc., etc. So this creates depression, this creates mistrust between people and their government. Uh, and of course, I mean, a uh, situation in no country is ideal. Uh, you can always find some real reasons to pick on and exaggerate uh, and emphasize. So I think, but, but still, uh, we might then look potentially maybe at some long-term effects on society. What to do about it? Um, there are not, uh, I mean, that many answers. Uh, the editors of uh, portals or, for example, the um, uh, management of Twitter, for example, when they fight with Daesh, uh, etc., they already take certain measures. When they identify that those are bots uh, spreading messages or, or those are trolls spreading hate speech, which they often do, they just uh, close delete. those accounts, delete the comments, etc. Uh, I think uh, people themselves could be much more active. What I mentioned initially about anyone being able to actually take part in this new uh, war in the information environment, it's, it's very true. I mean, we shouldn't passively just look at uh, what's going on. We should actually report these instances. Because even on uh, Facebook, you might not always be successful, but if you keep reporting, it might actually eventually have certain effect. And the last thing, obviously, is um, raising the awareness of the society. Because although I just said that uh, there is already a decent level of awareness, I think still we have certain vulnerable society groups uh, which are maybe not that familiar with the internet world or uh, which are more likely to fall for certain tricks that the trolls use. For example, using a profile picture of a really nice girl in a bikini, making very, <laughs> asking very nice questions, naive questions, etc. So people have to be aware of these methods, of this diversity, uh, so that, yeah, they just don't engage in the conversation and that they report this activity. Here I might play a bit kind of advocate of the devil rule uh, or advocate of a committed citizen. And this leads to the question that let's see if we read comments under Internet Post, news, all that. How can we distinguish between trolls and desperate citizens? Correct. This desperate is citizens yeah. or citizens who just who just not sharing the opinion of ours. Exactly. And this is the trap uh, that the society falls into because uh, there, there is a certain movement already in, in the internet commentaries, at least in Latvia, where people uh, themselves say, oh, you're a troll. Let's ignore you. See, you're a troll. Go away. You're a troll. And often I also think myself, well, how, how do you know it's a troll? Because if, uh, if it is a copy-paste comment, which can be verified, 
That's I mean, clear, that's right? Clear. If you can have a look at their IP address and you see that this person has made more than 100 comments during this day, most likely a troll. Uh, also, organized trolls, normally they are ideological. What we would call an ordinary internet troll, mm -hmm. it's just the person who wants to annoy somebody, right? Yes. Or disrupt, com so they're normally not ideological. Mm -hmm. So these organized trolls, they have ideological messages, but so can a citizen, right, with exactly. an opinion. And this is the trick, and this is the point where nobody can prove it. Nobody can really prove it. Then you have to do a really deep research, uh, try to see if this account is linked to any other accounts, what's the history of posts, uh, like uh, if it's a profile on Facebook or any other, like, um, like how old is it, uh, do they have any friends, are those friends real, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, but that's a huge amount of work and no ordinary internet user will actually do it. Uh, this is something what uh, could be like a particular research project or work. maybe that's something what security services can be doing. And just to make it clear, the, the difference between trolls and bots, when we speak about bots, it means automated network of accounts, for example, on Twitter. When we speak about trolls, we speak human individuals uh, who manage, and we know, as Elena just mentioned, there are cases when former Russian trolls just quitted the job. They were unhappy, they were dissatisfied, uh, and they wrote a lot about their former work in these, just for the sake of easiness, let's call them troll factories. So, of course, it's open source, it has to be used with certain criticism, but still, we assume that we know quite a lot about how this type of trolling works, also on the very operational level, uh, meaning that a professional troll may manage 30 to 40 accounts parallelly in a, I mean, proper eight hours daily shift. So this is not just a myth that, oh, there, there are no trolls, this is just propaganda. No, we know for fact there, there, are, su there are such organizations. However, uh, what we know from the troll factories, again, this is not the nice name, but let's call them troll mm -hmm. factories just to keep our life easier. What we know about the troll factories operating in Russia, most of them, they do the job in terms of languages, in Russian, sometimes in Ukrainian, uh, and also in English. However, on the smaller languages that not that many people in Russia may speak, I might have the temptation to think that for speaking or trolling in a credible way on smaller languages, you need to hire locals. Yes, I would agree. Or also sometimes uh, what we've seen during our research um, in, uh, in the Latvian internet space is that sometimes uh, Google Translator is used oh. or sometimes <laughs> you see that those are not uh, native speakers, mm -hmm. but they clearly have a command of Latvian language, mm -hmm. but they make a lot of grammatical and, and other Stylistic type of mistake, uh, yeah. mistakes. So you see they're not Is native speakers. Um, yes, please. Okay. Uh, but they're, they're tr trying to pretend to be. But again, coming back to your um, uh, question, uh, it is hard to say uh, who is actually a person strongly committed to some ideological cause and just stating his or her opinion and who is actually being paid for it. Because um, I th I'm sure that uh, not all of whom we would call organized trolls are receiving salary for it. They can be organized uh, as part of some maybe NGO or some other social movement or social group. They can be organized but not, being, not receiving money for what they do but they still take part as a troll army in this informational uh, war. So, uh, but at the same time, I think um, Daesh is much stronger on that. Although they also pay people, but I think they, because um, as one of uh, our US colleagues uh, recently called it, uh, it is kind of a revolutionary movement, revolutionary not in a good uh, understanding of this word, but in its essence, in its format. Uh, therefore, there is a lot of this ideological enthusiasm and people do a lot of work voluntarily. So it's not hierarchical, it's just a network. Uh, 
uh, that supports each other and, 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 and takes part in this war. In the Russian case, it's different. It is very hierarchical and they have to pay people to get them to do mm -hmm. what they want them to do on most occasions. But I, I wanted to ask you, I mean, um, there is a lot of discussion that uh, Finland is also under informational attack, uh, that there is a lot of troll activity. Uh, unfortunately, I don't remember her name, but there was a female uh, Finnish journalist who I think wrote uh, something about these troll farms and then she got heavily trolled herself, etc. There have been reports uh, of uh, some strange news websites popping up which pretend to be posting real news, but actually they're very unfavorable to Finland, etc. Like, what's, what's your assessment of like, what's going on? There is nothing that much specific of Finland, except again the language. Mm -hmm. uh, this happens all over Central Europe, done mostly, as far as we know, by locals. Setting up strange websites or, or posting news, or sometimes if, if a person tries to go after these kind of trolling activities, yes, I mean, sometimes you get the reactions to your, to your social networks, to your open media profiles. Uh, the Finnish expert you mentioned, she is not the only one at all. Mm -hmm. Standard information operations, so I wouldn't say that it's anything specific for or against Finland. It's happening in a, in a much wider spectrum uh, in this country as well. However, this, this leads me to the question, which probably we have no definite answer. But you already mentioned trolling via Google Translate, and uh, I imagine it my, on my native language, ethnically I'm Hungarian. It's really funny that Google Translate cannot really properly handle Hungarian. So you, really, really, you can really recognize if a person is using Google Translate. But if we go beyond simply the question of language, in order to do proper trolling, you need to know not only the language, but also the historical context, the political context, the, the narratives that resonate in the certain society. Mm -hmm. So you cannot do random trolling against whatever country simply because you don't know the context. You don't know the myth or the weaknesses you can play upon. You don't know the entry points uh, along which you can divide the society or if you can weaken or, you said, depress uh, the society. And this leads me to the theoretical question whether this form of new generation warfare whether it's culture dependent? I would say that uh, the way we are organized currently uh, as states, uh, as countries, I would say that uh, definitely yes. I mean, there are certain things that would resonate uh, beyond borders. Uh, for example, what Russia has been using very effectively is, uh, for example, anti-American sentiment, pre very much present in different societal groups in, in Europe. So that's not country or ethnic group uh, specific. But of course, uh, they also have done a very good job uh, analyzing the target audiences and collecting the necessary information about uh, social issues. So it's not just cultural, it's also about social conditions, economic uh, problems, all sorts of vulnerabilities that we have. And the trouble is that we as democratic uh, systems, we are very transparent, we're very open. So it's very easy to find out uh, what's wrong, uh, what's happening, what's current. Um, if you look at Russia, it's very easy for them just to classify everything or just to deny access to information uh, or to manipulate with information which we can receive uh, through television or internet uh, because they have the control uh, over a large part of it. Uh, so I think they're very easily explore, exploiting this, what we uh, find as our strength, our transparency. At the same time, uh, in this respect, in intelligence gathering or predicting uh, our further steps, that can potentially be um, a weakness. I again resort to the role of the advocate of the devil. Again, the question of how to counter all that. Collecting information about the country. There is nothing illegal in that. You use open sources, you do nothing else than any normal diplomatic representation does. Or uh, any researchers, any scientists do who are specialized in regions and countries. And this leads to the problem of, uh, of how to counter. Because on a long, there is nothing that much illegal. This is very important to understand. At least in our 
liberal perception of, uh, of rule of law. And of course, from if we perceive law and legal system from the very technical perspective, technically it's possible to ban whatever type of speech. You can pass a law and ban this or that type of remarks. But that would mean the very end of, uh, of all what our community has been built on. This is the main challenge. How to protect, or this is one of the, one of the main challenges, how to protect ourselves from these kind of operations while they do not violate our laws. Because hate speech is a clear case uh, in hate, hate, against hate speech. We have regulations, we can interrupt, we can take legitimate actions. But having a different opinion, it's not a crime and shall not be a crime, I think. Yes, of course. And I think the major difference here is that uh, during the information uh, campaign against Ukraine and, and uh, Western democracies, uh, Russia has used a lot of what we would call black or grey propaganda. So uh, all countries uh, do intelligence gathering, all countries also do propaganda, but that's what we would call the white propaganda. So that's normal part of public diplomacy. So we take uh, a positive fact, which is a real fact, so we're not lying about it, we're not faking it. It's a real positive fact about, I don't know, Finland, Latvia, Hungary, whatever. Uh, and uh, it is, let's say, our Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which puts out this information to the public, to foreign partners or the local public, and say, well, look at this, aren't we good? And uh, it is one-sided information, so it is, uh, in a way, uh, propaganda, but it's a white propaganda, because it's a truth, uh, it's a fact taken out of the context, but it's a true fact, and you have a clear signature there. It is the Ministry of Foreign Affairs who's saying that. Mm -hmm. What we see in the Russian case is that um, either they use grey propaganda, so you can identify where this is coming from, for example, a particular TV channel or a newspaper. But at the same time, the information presented is not quite true. It's manipulated. So it, either it's completely fake or it's partially true, uh, or also the source uh, is actually not identified, so it's gray area. Uh, the worst case scenario, which we've also seen happening, is usage of black propaganda. This is something that our societies, our governments, our media would not do. Uh, or if they do, then that uh, would not be very ethical or, or illegal. Is uh, spreading blunt lies, fakes, and not showing who is the author of those. A, a very well-known example, I think, is um, referendum in Crimea, uh, when all of a sudden these posters appeared. I, I don't know if you've seen those. Of course. Yeah, so I think mo most of you must have seen those, the, the two pictures of uh, Crimean Peninsula with a Russian flag and bright future, or Crimean Peninsula on a black uh, background uh, with the Nazi uh, insignia on it and saying on 16th of March, you choose. But there is no uh, signature of who's the author of these posters. And also the fact that you know, if they vote pro-Ukraine, it means that they un end up in the hands of Nazis. That's also a fake, so it's not true information. So there you go. And this is the difference that when we talk about usage of, of propaganda, we need to distinguish uh, there. And this is something to add. Uh, which might probably be also kind of a new phenomenon. Again, I'm not that much an expert specifically on, uh, on information warfare. However, I recall not only the Crimea referendum, but also the, the shooting down of the Malaysian Airlines in last summer. And I remember the, the narratives, possible explanations uh, popping up from various actors uh, on the Russian side. It was very interesting to uh, to notice. Explanation number one, which popped up right after uh, the shooting down of the Malaysian Airlines, that those were the Ukrainians with an air defense missile. Explanation number two, that popped up from one of the separatist leaders, Igor Girkin Akastrelkov, he said right after the accident or the, the shooting down, again, I mean, one day after or something, that it was a remote controlled airplane already full of dead bodies, remote controlled, they led over separatist territories, then blown up there just in order to discredit uh, Donetsk and Luhansk National Republics. Narrative number three that popped up again from Russian official source 
was that Ukrainian air defense tried to shoot at Mr. Putin's airplane, which was flying not there and not then, but still, and they just made a mistake. Narrative number four, a Ukrainian ground attack airplane that raised that to the altitude it could never uh, climb high up, and it shot down the Malaysian airlines with automatic cannon. Narrative number five, Ukrainian fighter airplanes using the missiles. And there were a number of other narratives. Almost all of them were actually confirmed, kind of confirmed, by Russian official sources as well. And of course, you all notice that these narratives are contradicting each other as well. Either you blame Ukrainian air defense or you blame a Ukrainian fighter. But one ha would have to decide uh, which narrative is the real one. But many of these narratives were really conf in conflict with each other as well. And this leads to the point, what's the strategic objective? And the new element, which caught us, I guess, pretty much off-balanced, is that while in our, let's say, white propaganda, we would try to convince the target audience about what one ultimate truth. We want, them to me, we want them to believe one particular thing. This kind of self-contradicting propaganda, including blunt lies, I mean, absolute factual lies, it's not intended to, believe, to, to make you believe in one concrete thing, but to make you not believe in anything at all. And if you yes. stop, if you lose, if you lose your, your beliefs in your values, you stop believing in your allies, uh, you start questioning very fundamental values and, uh, and norms of, of your life and your state and your politics, then you are lost. To break your ability to resist. And that's why this form of, of information warfare, which is aimed not at, mi not just misleading you, but completely disorienting you, this is a novelty. And this is, this is really, really dangerous, particularly because from the legal perspective, it's not that easy to counter. It's not against the law to lie. Well, maybe I shouldn't really argue with a historian. <laughs> you can, why <laughs> but, not? But uh, I was just wondering, uh, I think it's a fatal mistake because, you know, <laughs> historians, they 100% always know all the facts and dates and everything <laughs> no, better than you can ever know. But anyway, um, it's not to, not to argue because uh, I, I'm not uh, trying to contradict what you just said. I'm just curious, like, um, uh, isn't it kind of also similar to what was happening during the Cold War in terms that also the uh, informational attacks from both sides were attempted at uh, kind of shaking uh, the, the core values that the ideological systems were built upon. Uh, maybe it was done in a different way, but the strategy was kind of the same, because I completely agree with you. I think this is the overarching objective, to actually attack these core values, political values, moral values, etc., uh, making us uh, doubt whether our Euro-Atlantic course uh, our democratic systems are actually what we think they are and whether that's the right uh, choice. Uh, but yeah, wasn't that what was kind of happening during the Cold War, maybe with slightly different methods? I see a difference there. In the Cold War there were positive messages. Whether they were credible or not, but there were positive messages. There were ideologies to promote. The Soviet Union invested a lot of resources to, to promote its own ideology in the West. Not necessarily only about communism, but also about equality, workers' rights, and a lot of other things which were not necessarily connected only and exclusively to the Soviet Union. But the, the Eastern Bloc had its own ideology to promote, and also the West had its own ideology to promote. And of course, on the one hand, yes, it was aimed to weaken uh, also the other. But again, there was a positive message they wanted to convince the others to believe in certain things. Not in the things they believed before, but in some different things. But complete disorientation. Uh, I think it was not that much on the agenda, uh, or not to that extent, what mm -hmm. we see today. And th this again uh, takes us back to one of our starting points, technology matters. When I, back home in Hungary, when I spoke to my students about Cold War period, and when you make them just try to imagine you have no internet at all. See, if you want to have information about what's happening, let's say, just in the neighboring country, not to mention the other side of the Iron Curtain, you listen to the radio, and then basically that's it. If 
uh, you could even, even if you go to the library, you can, if you are lucky, you find a few newspapers, but most of the books you find are absolutely outdated. So that time, simply the speed of, uh, of transferring information over the iron curtain was, was much slower. And here with the information age, basically the speed of transferring information has basically become zero, absolutely mm -hmm. real time. And yeah. I think this is, this is an important difference. Yeah, and I, I want to pick up on the point uh, about the ideologies. I think you're absolutely right. And this is also a kind of a strange phenomena that if you look at Russia, uh, they, they don't have one clear ideology in, in the classical sense of political ideologies. They have a mix of at least three different approaches, which is extremely convenient because it gives them this uh, flexibility. And this way, using this global information environment, they can very easily and quickly appeal to these very different and contradictory uh, political, societal, cultural, etc. groups. Uh, so this is also, um, in a way, uh, giving them a big advantage, which we don't really have, because we have a very clear definition of our ideology, who we are, what we stand for, and we are not uh, trying to be that flexible with that uh, different and contradictory uh, audiences. Well, at least uh, in, in, in general uh, terms. So, yeah, I think it's, it's a very fair point. And actually, I'm happy. I'm very happy that we are not trying uh, to copy the model of, of information warfare. Many or adversaries are, uh, are using, and it's not only about Russia, it's about Daesh as well, and uh, great powers learn from each other. And I'm very sure that we could name a few other actors on the globe who are watching very carefully the information warfare experiences gained uh, over the war in Ukraine or over uh, the war against Daesh. And we may very well see these methods popping up uh, on other parts of the globe as well, used by other actors, probably uh, in a much more developed way. So this conflict, uh, what we are talking about here, is not only about the wars and conflicts we are watching today. It's also about the future. It's very unlikely mm -hmm. that the situation would get nicer or much more moderate uh, in, in, in these terms. I, I think it will get um, even scarier yes. uh, in terms of uh, this advancing uh, technology because uh, we already spoke a bit about this in gathering information about your target audiences by using social media, etc. But we also have the big data. There are already a lot of commercial solutions. Some uh, states are experimenting on analyzing uh, the big data. But I think uh, there will be a point where uh, using uh, vulnerabilities in the cyber environment, our adversaries will get access to such information that they will be able not just to, let's say, identify where to hit us, uh, but also to predict uh, what our societies are going to do, what our governments are going to do, etc. And that will happen at great speed and with great ease that we can't even imagine today. Which leads us back to, again, one of the starting points. In my opinion, just to wrap up shortly, what's the best defense against, against information warfare? It's not necessarily counterattacks, but strengthening our own strengths, our own values and awareness and the, con and the consciousness about our own values and about the norms that keep our societies and, uh, and alliances together. And if we are firm enough in our, in our values, in our beliefs, in our convictions, it greatly decreases our vulnerability to, to new generation warfare. Yes, I totally second that and uh, I think truth also will prevail, always. Truth is a relatively good defense, yes. Thank you very much for all of you for watching us, Thank for spending us the evening here. And please follow, keep following the Liga conference. Thank you all.
I want you to get together. I want you to get together. I want you to get together. Put your hands together one time. I want you to get together. I want you to get together. Somebody wear me to the face 